Now we're going to have uh, our first speaker, who's Gordon Awandari. And Gordon was one of the people who attended in London. And he's going to tell us about how he's been able to build capacity in West African research. As a sweet boy. Thank you very much. Good morning. So um, I think the discussions that were going on at the end of the last session um, sort of set the stage for um, what I'm going to talk about. because. Um, basically, where we are is that um, the continent has made some progress in terms of basic science research. And we now have, you know, scientists who have the, the capacity um, and the skills to be able to um, effectively collaborate on the HCA, HCA project. And, and so I just wanted to talk about what we have done in Ghana as an example of um, what has been going on uh, on the continent over the last 10 years or so. And, um, you know, when I went to the London meeting, one of the discussions we had uh, with Musa and um, Alex was to, you know, reach out to um, other African scientists. And so today we see uh, many more African scientists than we had in London. Um, and some of these scientists who are in the room are leading similar efforts as the one I'm going to describe. And they are all well positioned to, you know, to, to partner and to collaborate uh, with HCA. Well, so um, just a little bit of uh, perspective. We, we know that um, Africa has lagged behind, and in particular West Africa, we've lagged behind in basic science research because of the amount of, um, you know, funding that's required for basic research. Basic research is you know, like the most expensive type of uh, research. And in Africa, we've often had um, the ability to do um, the less expensive types of research, which is social science research, public health research. Uh, those ones that do not, uh, that are not capital intensive. Capital intensive in terms of physical infrastructure as well as uh, uh, the human resource capacity. Um, and, you know, we haven't had the type of sustained investments that are necessary to build this capacity. And um, it's been difficult to engage African governments to spend money on basic science because it's very difficult for them to see the, the immediate impact of, uh, you know, looking at genomes of uh, parasites or uh, transcription in cells. How does that help them get uh, elected in the next election? It's often not clear. And because of that, resources have not uh, been allocated to um, basic science research. Um, as an example, even though um, all the African leaders committed to spend 1% of GDP on um, science and research. And I think that was in 2006. Uh, up to now, only about four or five of them have actually done this. And in West Africa, I don't think any single country has committed this amount of resources to, to research. In Ghana, we are somewhere closer to zero than to one. Um, historically, um, a lot of research funding has gone to Eastern Africa and Southern Africa. Um, and West Africa, we have uh, historically not been a, a hotspot for uh, research collaboration. So, um, you know, there are many theories for how this happened, but, you know, uh, it could be that um, the, the East had a more favorable research climate because maybe there are uh, uh, governments and institutions uh, were more supportive of these efforts. Uh, is a legacy of uh, friendships from, you know, colonial friendships, you know? Um, is it political stability? For some time, we've had um, turmoil in many parts of West Africa, so is it, is it one of the reasons? But anyway, this has changed over the last uh, 10 years. And I think uh, from where I said, three major initiatives have really transformed the basic science landscape um, in Africa. And I think these, the key things that made this uh, initiative have uh, a lasting impact are that they allowed Africa-led uh, you know, projects. So these projects I'm going to talk about, PIs from Africa were allowed to lead and to receive funds directly. Many other funding schemes, African PIs are often, um, you know, part of the projects as collaborators, and the funding often goes to the uh, northern partners, and then we get a sub-award, and then we get sent money every now and then, and 
And if we don't deliver the money stops coming. Um, these projects have uh, directly put money in the hands of African scientists. So the first one is the World Bank, African Centers for Excellence. So this is a major initiative that the World Bank started in 2013, 2014. And they, they basically had a clever uh, strategy. They, they designed a scheme that said, we're going to uh, put out a call for competitive applications to establish centers of excellence that will provide specialized training uh, for African scientists. But African governments who wanted to participate would sign up, would sign an agreement that says that if money comes into your country to any institution, that money gets charged to your national debt, you know, as a loan. So they give the money to the universities to build capacity and do research, and then that gets added to the national debt stock. So, you know, that, that was a very clever strategy to get African governments to, to spend money on science that they would never have done. They would never have been able to create this amount of money in their budget to fund research. So I thought this was very clever. And this, um, they've done this in three phases. The phase one was East, uh, sorry, West and Central Africa. Then they did a phase two, which was East and Southern Africa. And then they just recently did a phase three, which was um, West and Central again, uh, together with Djibouti. And uh, they renewed some of the old ones and then established uh, new ones. So to date, 45 universities um, in 19 countries are implementing 58 of these centers. And this has been a massive uh, you know, uh, impact on uh, science capacity building. The other one is the Welcome Trust Deltas uh, program. This is a program that is uh, mainly funded through the Welcome Trust, but it's uh, um, operated from the African Academy of Sciences uh, in Nairobi. And they, in 2015, also committed $100 million and they funded 11 programs across uh, the continent. You can see the map there that highlights where the programs are, are allocated. Um, but basically, this program focused on science, okay? So the, the, the program focused on building capacity for science, training people, and building fiscal capacity. And, and this also has made a big impact. Then the third one, uh, many of you know about is East Africa, uh, you know, project. Uh, this one, funded by NIH and uh, Welcome. They've, they've committed about $170 million, and they've funded several programs across the continent, as you can see. And again, these programs emphasized more of uh, research than capacity building, but in the process, uh, a lot of capacity has been built. So then uh, our center, our center is called WACBIB. Uh, we have shamelessly benefited from all these programs that I've described. <laughs> in fact, uh, I am the only PI, who, I'm the only person who's a PI on all the, the three schemes. So, so, so we, are, we are shamelessly taking advantage of all the capacity building that, that has uh, come our way. So, so we started our effort in 2014. Uh, colleagues of mine from the Department of Biochemistry, uh, Salem Monica Baja, the University of Ghana, the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, our Department of Biomedical Engineering, colleagues from the School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, and then our uh, university computing uh, systems. Uh, we came together to put a proposal to the World Bank when the African Center of Excellence was, was announced uh, to create a center of excellence for cell and molecular biology. And um, you know, uh, we, we were lucky enough to be one of the, the, the selected centers. Christian is here. Christian also has a center in Redeemers University. So. <clears throat> Um, basically, the center is a research and training center. So since uh, 2014, we've uh, you know, gone a long way. We started by trying to set up the institutional structure that would allow us to be flexible and to be innovative. So we had to set up a system where the center is at least semi-autonomous. We, we wish we could be fully autonomous, but at least we are semi-autonomous uh, and we are free from some of the university bureaucracy, some of it, not all of it. Um, so. As, as a director of the center, I have the powers of a dean, and I can employ people, and I can run a, a, a bank account, and I can, um, you, know, uh, you know, raise funds and spend funds. Uh, you know, so that gives us flexibility um, to be innovative and to be more efficient than the normal university system uh, would work. Um, on the flip side, we don't take money from the university. That means we have to uh, keep looking for money uh, in order to stay uh, uh, you know, operational. 
Um, and then I'm also um, a, a, le a leader for one of the doctor's programs that we're hosting at, uh, um, at uh, Del uh, WACBIP. And uh, we have also been partners on some of the East Africa uh, projects. So basically, uh, we started off uh, with infectious diseases because we had to specialize uh, for the World Bank program. So, you know, our strength was infectious diseases, so mainly doing pathogen biology. So we have a whole bunch of projects that students are doing under infectious diseases. And then with the Wellcome Trust, we asked for support to do human genetics, which, um, you know, served as a bridge to start doing non-communicable diseases, and then East Africa too came on board to support some of these projects. So, so now we have a full pipeline um, of uh, projects ranging from infectious to non-communicable disease and, and all the interactions that happen in between. Um, we've developed specialized um, training programs uh, because building capacity means that we should be able to have um, you know, training on the African continent so that um, uh, when people do their PhDs here, they are likely to stay here than if they did it in, uh, in the US or in the UK. So we've developed uh, PhD and master's programs and we, we offer um, you know, a range of options, but mainly uh, on the side of molecular sciences, molecular and cellular sciences. Uh, we are currently trying to develop an MSc in bioinformatics, uh, which is also in, in, um, in response to the need for capacity building in this uh, area in, in West Africa. We don't have any um, you know, degree awarding program in West Africa for bioinformatics. We don't have a master's or PhD uh, in the subregion. And we think that this needs to be addressed. Uh, we're also thinking about an MSc in research translation product development for, for our students. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, we, we've taken advantage of any funding that, that comes around. Um, I was teasing Christian that um, he, he's grabbing any money that comes on the continent, but uh, we've learned from him and we're trying to do the same thing. So what we've done is that, <laughs> what we've done is that, um, you know, starting from the World Bank funding, we have then built a full pipeline, you know, from graduate internships to, you know, senior postdocs. And we've been able to find funding to support the various layers of, of, uh, of the pipeline so that, you know, the best students from masters can go to PhD, can go to early postdoc, can go to um, advanced uh, postdoc or career development fellowships. And we have had support from, you know, a lot of funders, as you can see here. Um, so just to give you a snapshot, uh, since 2014 when we started, um, we've had 143 master's fellows, and the gender breakdown is there. PhD is 81, and postdocs 22. And these are from across the continent, as you can see. M most of them are from Ghana, of course, because that's where we're based. But you can see that um, there's a lot around the subregion, and even we have several from Kenya and even some as far down here. Um, so basically, what we've been trying to do is to um, spread the opportunity. And one of the ways to do that is by building partnerships. So you can see that the, the map of the fellows sort of reflects where our partners are. Uh, because we've built partnerships with uh, uh, colleagues across the continent who have the capacity to do the type of research that we're doing. So the students don't have to uh, be at the University of Ghana for the, the entire period of their study. Um, we have one year of coursework, which they have to do at the University of Ghana, which we think is important for them to bond with their, their colleagues from other countries. But then after that, they can go back to uh, another African institution that's closer to uh, where, where they live or where they want to establish themselves and then do their research pro project there and then bring the, uh, the thesis when they're done. So in the room here, I have several collaborators, um, you know, Faye to CF from, uh, you know, Kemri Kilifi, Alfred is there from the Gambia, Christian is here from Nigeria and, you know, um, and others. So we, we, we build these partnerships and use that as a vehicle uh, to find the best students and bring them into the program. Um, also, to be a center of excellence, it must look like one. So we, we invested a lot of resources to build capacity. As I mentioned before, uh, basic science research is very expensive. So our strategy was to buy one big equipment each year. So first year, we bought a flow cytometer. Um, the second year, we bought a, a confocal microscope. The third year, we bought a high-performance computing system. 
the fourth year, we, we added more uh, facilities in terms of uh, a building. And then the uh, last year, we, we've uh, uh, worked with Noguchi to set up a sequencing platform. So basically, we committed, you know, three to $400,000 each year for capital investments such as this. <clears throat> uh, the other thing that we've uh, done very effectively, because of the, where most of us came from, uh, most of the people at the center are people who train abroad and came back home. And a lot of us are in touch with people who are abroad and they want to come back home. So what, one of the things we had to do was to create the environment that will allow people like us who train abroad to come back home. So, you know, putting the facilities in place, but also putting in, um, you know, uh, the operational machinery that will allow them to come in and have a good salary and have access to, um, you know, facilities. So we've leveraged several fellowship schemes, including our own deltas, the Creek Africa Network. Uh, Yolanda is here, she'll talk about the Creek Africa Network, uh, uh, of which we are partners. But we leverage these fellowships um, to put forward our young scientists so that they can um, access these, uh, these grants, which will give them a dedicated salary so they don't have to uh, uh, start teaching as lecturers, which usually consumes uh, all their time and then their career never takes off as, uh, as researchers. So we give them these fellowships, two to three year fellowships, which allows them to establish themselves before taking up uh, full-time faculty, uh, faculty positions. And, and in doing this, we've been able to uh, you know, make a small effort towards reversing the brain drain. So we've, we brought back about seven scientists uh, who, who, uh, who were abroad, who finished their PhD, were doing a postdoc, uh, but we've, we've been able to um, uh, convince them that they can succeed uh, on, the, on the continent. So we brought them back. And the, the impact of having that is that the, the general quality of the science uh, at the center has gone up. Uh, they've also helped in supervising the students, masters and PhD students. And also this type of schemes gives opportunities to our our uh, PhD students when they graduate. Um, um, I want to also highlight Alassane, who is here. Alassane, um, he came back to the Institute Pasteur in Dakar, but uh, we, we also played a role in convincing him that it was, uh, it was worth coming back to the continent, and he collaborates with us. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's some of the, the, the success that we've been able to, to, to bring forward. Now, um, it all looks good, but uh, you can see from the students here that they are still worried because the, 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 the success over the five years, um, you know, doesn't tell the whole story. Um, there's, there's still a lot of uh, uh, issues that we're dealing with. The, sustain, the sustainability of the funding, you know, would national governments, uh, you know, pick up the, you know, the bill when we don't have grants? So in Ghana, we've been struggling to set up a research fund. Many African countries have been trying to do the same. And um, if we don't have these, when I don't have a grant, then what happens to all the students that we have? Um, you know, yesterday at the side meeting, we were talking about reagents, getting reagents onto the continent. It's one of the most difficult things uh, for scientists. As a director of a program, I spend about 40 to 50% of my time trying to figure out how to get reagents for my students to work. You know, so, you know, trying to get collaborators to buy reagents and send to you. When you travel, you take an extra suitcase to bring reagents. You know, there's always constant coordination of reagents, which takes a lot of our productive time. And it also makes us less competitive because, um, you know, we, we have a, a lead time of three to six months in order to get reagents. When I was in the U.S., I order everything and I get it the next day. You know, so you can do an experiment. It doesn't work. You order reagents and try the experiment the next day. On the continent, we can't do that. When you do an experiment, it doesn't work. You have to wait three months to try it again. You know, so th these are some of the challenges that we face in being competitive. Uh, at the institutional level, we're, we're struggling to modernize the structures. You know, when I started... Um, uh, the postdoc program, a lot of the administrative personnel in the university, they didn't know what to do with the postdocs. What kind of animal is a postdoc? You know, in the university structure, there's no space for a postdoc. So they don't know how to handle it. Are they students? Are they faculty? What are they? You know, so these are things that we need to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, formalize. Equipment maintenance is a big problem. Private sector involvement. Would the private sector, um, you know, step up? In West Africa, there's hardly any private sector in terms of uh, R&D. And then we all know about the, the problems of getting around the continent. If we want to collaborate, you know, African leaders have to loosen the travel restrictions so we can move around. Um, just before I, I end, I wanted to, you know, highlight this. So uh, a few months ago, when we were doing our, our recruitment for um, the August intake, we had 10 fellowships to give. And we advertised on our website and on Twitter and all that. 
And at the end of the period, we had 518 applications. And these are the distribution of the applications across the continent. 10 PhD fellowships. And these are the applications we got. I mean, um, yesterday we were talking about Flair with AS, and it's the same thing. You put out a fellowship and look at you know, the interest. And a lot of these are very, very good uh, quality candidates. So we've, we've set the, uh, you know, the ball rolling, and the young people are very interested. The desire is there. So we need to plan how to cope. Otherwise, their hopes would crash, and then we would have a problem getting back to the momentum that we've uh, got it right now. OK, so final slide. I hope I have one minute. How would the, um, the HCA engage? How, how best can they engage? I think from all the conversations we had, I think the best way or the best uh, uh, strategy is to start with engaging with the Center of Excellence that have already been established. You know, we have you know, hundreds of them now based on the three schemes that I've uh, uh, described. We have several African centers. What I've described here about WAGBIP, you can have the same thing at uh, Christian Happy's place in Kemri, Kilifi, in uh, Dakar, um, you know, MRC Gambia. You have the same type of systems there. And there's room for collaboration across the country. There's, there's a lot of top quality uh, uh, scientists. Tumbi is here from uh, uh, KwaZulu Natal, uh, University of, yeah, KwaZulu Natal. He, he also has a very um, excellent HIV group. So, um, I think starting from that point, engaging those who, who are, uh, you know, in a position to, um, to engage productively in terms of uh, designing projects together, which would be answering local questions, but then leveraging the, uh, the, the, the platforms, the, the technology that uh, HCA brings. I think that's, uh, that's, that would be a good place to start. But in doing that, we should, uh, of course, ensure that there's equity, make sure that centers that are not centers of excellence, but that are trying to come up, we give them an opportunity. Musa and um, Alex already mentioned this, trying to bring them for workshops and um, giving them opportunities to be part of, uh, of the program. And then, you know, we, we discussed about having roadshows and workshops across the continent. You can use the centers of excellence as basis to do workshops and roadshows that can, you know, draw others who are in less endowed institutions to be able to uh, also access uh, uh, the, you know, the, the platforms. And then, you know, building capacity uh, and empowering the young scientists. Um, I mentioned postdoctoral training is something that is badly needed on the continent right now. We need to promote the culture of postdoctoral training that um, scientists don't finish their PhD and go straight into teaching, but that they should have a period where they can develop their research careers and start uh, uh, building a, a, a group. So, um, you know, ACA can help with co-mentoring some of these young scientists, giving them opportunities to visit labs overseas, and generally, um, uh, you know, helping their development. So thank you very much. Somebody has one burning question? Okay. Oh, Gentina. I, I don't need to ask you, but you want to so, so Gordon, that, that is wonderful um, experience. Thank you for sharing those insights. So, so if, I, if, if I can just ask you, in, in all of your experience, um, thinking about sort of the question of, of equity, what 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 would be your definition of, of equity in all of this? So what constitutes equity in in specifically the work that you do and the center that you've set up? Yeah. Okay, so um, our core business is identifying the best young talents and then helping them to develop. So for us, what we try to do, and with the map I showed you, is to give everybody a chance. So when we, we, we have opportunities, we advertise them as widely as possible, and we pay attention to applications from everywhere. You know, from Djibouti to uh, you know uh, Gambia, we pay we pay attention to everybody. We we look at people's background when we are doing the selection. Where did the person come from? What opportunities have they had? Would this person uh, have been better, or have would they have a better um, uh, you know record or track record if they were in um, UCT or in um, uh, you know MRC Gambia? So we take all this into consideration when we are selecting. Um, you know, uh, students, because we want to make sure that the best people get a chance. 
no matter where they are coming from. So we take the context into account, where they, where they got their training. And the expectations of them should take that into account, where they got their training. Uh, you know. So this, this, is, this is how we, we, we try to make sure that everybody has a chance. Thank you.